Hello, everybody. Good it's so good to see all of you. It really is. Now, we're in John's Gospel, Chapter 8. John's Gospel, Chapter 8. Last week, we uh, did the, uh, the wonderful story of the woman who had been caught in a sinful act, the act of adultery, and how Jesus dealt with her. Now, remember, that story may not be in the original manuscripts of John's Gospel. It's a real story. It's historical. It may have been in Luke's Gospel. We don't know, but it was a fragment floating around and finally settled in John's Gospel. But the reason John put it there, or maybe the early church put it there, was because it dealt with sin, which is really what chapter 8 is all about. Sin and forgiveness and escape from judgment. So we're going to begin reading with verse 31 of, of, of the chapter, and this is part of a larger discussion. I try to pick out a part of the discussion that would give you the essence of the discussion and also have some very quotable verses in it. So here we are in verse 31. We'll be done in verse 36. And to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let me do a little teaching teach up to the first idea. So the first idea is kind of moment. Let me teach up to it. There were those who believed in him, John's gospel says. Now they were believing in him as Messiah, a political leader. And remember earlier on when he fed the 5,000, he um, was so impressive that they wanted to make him king with an army. And he fled there because that wasn't his ministry. His work as Messiah was dying for us on the cross shedding his blood for our sin. He wasn't a political leader. So when it says that they believed in him, they believed him as that, that political Messiah that they thought was going to come, but they weren't believing in him as a savior of the world, and they were not taking into their life his life and living the way he was teaching. So he says, listen, you guys are believing in me, but you're not leading the life that I'm teaching. Now, a real disciple is someone who follows the life of Christ and lives the life that he taught. I hear for, let me just give you an example. I hear from people all the time, Pastor, a lot of marriages are in trouble. And you wouldn't believe the marriages, the people that you know that their marriages are troubled. You wouldn't believe it, Pastor. Now, I want you to hear the truth, and it's difficult to hear. Tinkerbell's not going to come around spreading pixie dust saying, your marriage is healed. Not magical that way. Oprah's not going to say, your marriage is healed and your marriage is healed and your marriage is healed. <laughs> That's not how it works. What happens is that, that you become convinced of the truth of Scripture about how marriage is to be. And you decide to start living that truth. You study Matthew 19 and what Jesus said about how a husband and a wife, how the two become one flesh. Or you read what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, and you decide that I don't understand this, I don't agree with it, I'm not sure that it's true, but because Jesus taught it, I'm going to do it. And what C.S. Lewis said was that we know what's right to do, we start doing it even though we don't want to do it, pretty soon we start wanting to do it. As soon as we start doing it, we start wanting to do it. And what we have here is this idea that if you're really a disciple of Jesus, it's because you have decided to live the truth of his teaching. So we get down to this now. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's not philosophical truth. It's not a scientific truth. It's practical truth. You decide to live the life I'm teaching, and because you're living the life I'm teaching... You are discovering that it's true, that it really works. And so you're practicing a life, and you discover that it's the right way to live. Now, there are different levels of OCD, you know, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And I have a, a low level of it. 
And so I might wash my hands 10 times a day in a certain way or say certain words in certain orders, you know, like some people have this malady do. But I, I have to have everything around me. I'm going to be happy. Everything around me has got to be in order. So, for example, I go to a restaurant, sit down at the table. The, the fork, the spoon, the knife have got to point the right direction. All the same direction. The plate's got to be exactly in the middle, right in front of where I am. My napkins, he placed a certain way on my lap. When they bring the bread tray, the bread tray has to be right in between me and Debbie, turn exactly the right direction. It has to all be symmetrical. Now, this is no way to live. I can't be happy unless the table is orderly. And it's not just the table. Wherever I sit, wherever I work, everything's got to be in order. Now, this, let me say again, it's no way to live. It's just a stupid way to live. And so I've told myself, when you sit down at that table, it doesn't matter which way the fork and spoon face. It doesn't matter where the bread plate is. It doesn't matter where your plate doesn't matter. Nothing matters. You will not rearrange it. You will not. And so I sit down and I hold myself and I control myself. It's agony. <laughs> so you see, you decide that this is the way that Jesus taught for us to live in our marriages, our finances, with our children, the way we live with our spirit, to be happy, not sad, to be peaceful, not angry, to be a good person, not a bad person. I'm, I'm going to live that way, and even though I don't want to, even though my skin is crawling sometimes because of the compulsion I have, that's really what sin is. It's a compulsion just like an obsessive compulsive disorder. And what Jesus says, when you live the right kind of way, you're set free from that. Let me tell you a joke. I cannot tell you a joke every Sunday. There are not enough jokes, okay? But I got a pretty good string going here of Sundays with jokes. But a man is walking by the asylum. You're getting this now. A man is walking by the asylum. Big stone wall, 20 foot tall. And people on the inside of the asylum are yelling out, 13, 13, 13, 13. He says, what's going on here? He's a little hole in the wall. He bends over, looks in the hole. A sharp stick pokes him in the eye. And the other side of the wall, people start going, 14, 14, 14. <laughs> now, this is a genre of joke. There's a lot of jokes like this, that the people inside the asylum are more sane than the people on the outside of the asylum. Are you getting this? So, <laughs> you may be thinking about, hey, those Christians... They're crazy. Look what they believe in an invisible sky God. They believe that a man was the son of God. Hey, look at those Christians. Look how they live, the things that they do. Look at what the real world is like. You Christians are crazy. Now, here we are on the inside of the asylum, you and me, and our, our marriages tend to be happier. We tend to live longer. We tend to be less depressed. We tend to fall into financial trouble less often. Our kids usually turn out better. I mean, who's crazy? Those of us on the inside of the asylum and those on the outside. And I don't know who you are, but are you getting tired of being poked in the eye? You getting tired? Why don't you start living like us crazy people? Even if you don't understand it, even if you don't yet believe it, even if it seems strange to you, you start living the life of Jesus and test and see if it's true that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, free from the compulsion of sin. Remember, remember, what we've been learning is sin is not God taking away the fun from life. Instead, he's teaching us the right kind of life that brings blessing. Now, it doesn't matter... Your status when it comes to Jesus and being set free. Now, this works two different ways. It doesn't matter how important you think you are. It doesn't matter how simple and small your life seems to be to you. He's teaching this thing about freedom, being set free. And they say, we are Abraham's children. Oh, let me just do a little bit of a footnote here, okay? 
three times in our passage, before this, this verse, after these verses, they say, we want to know who your father is. Abraham's our father. And after this passage is over, we're not illegitimate children. There's no birth story in John's gospel. There's nothing about the virgin birth, but I believe they're referring to it here. The Jews are referring to the myth, the stories around Jesus. He was the illegitimate son of a Roman soldier. And so they're talking about the virgin birth, but in a very strange way. Were they really believers in him? Not really. Anyway, they say, we're Abraham's children. We have never been slaves to anyone, which shows they did not know Hebrew history. They had been slaves to the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. Their, their existence had been slavery. We're Abraham's children. We haven't been slaves to anyone. What are you talking that we need to be free? What they were saying was, Jesus, we have status. We can trace ourselves back 1,200 years to Abraham. Why are you telling us about our sin and our need for repentance and forgiveness and a whole different kind of life following your teaching? We don't need that. We're Abraham's children. There's a famous actress... I won't mention her name because I understand uh, she's a very nice lady and she goes to church on Sunday, which is wonderful in Hollywood, so I don't mean to make fun of her, but you may remember the story nevertheless that her husband got pulled over for a DUI and she got out of the car and started talking to the police officer saying, do you know who I am? <laughs> oh, I see somebody shaking your head. Remember this, right? You know who, you, know, you can figure it out from the accent. Do you know who I am? Well, well who are you? You think because of your status that it's going to change how the police officer feels about the, the crime your husband committed? So you, you Jews think that you're going to have a difference in judgment because of your pedigree? Now you can turn that around. It doesn't matter how simple you think your life is. I mean, me personally, I'm a, I'm a nobody from a no family. Now, I, I didn't know my grandfather on my mother's side. I, I hear he's a wonderful man, but he died when I was six months old, age of... 52 from black lung. For 30 years, he went to work in the coal mines of eastern Kentucky. They lived in a little cinder block house by a dirt road in eastern Kentucky. My other grandfather, Pop, I knew him very well, a wonderful fellow, wonderful man, but he was an oysterman, a waterman. He went down and pulled the oysters out of the water, and then later on as he moved up in life, he got a chance to work for the CNO and a low job, a menial job in the CNO. I was the first person in my family that ever went to college, and by the way, I barely got out. And now I have reached the status of being famous when I go to Walmart. <laughs> People know me when I go buy a tomato. <laughs> I'm nobody. But you see, I discovered in Jesus that I'm somebody. So here we have people thinking their status makes the difference. And it doesn't. Now I grew up watching Orson Bean on television. I was a little kid. He was on To Tell the Truth. It was a very famous Twilight Zone he was in. I saw also when I was a little kid. Later on, he was uh, on Match Game and then Hollywood Squares. Orson Bean, The Block. And then you may know him. He was on Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. He was the, the shopkeeper. Well, you know, on Friday night, he was walking with some friends by the side of the road in Ventura, California, and a car clipped him. He fell into the traffic. Another car, they tried to distract the car and try to make it stop, but he didn't stop it. He hit him and killed him. He was 91 years old. 91. Now, Orson Bean became very famous, very popular early on in his life. He became an alcoholic and a drug addict. And even though he was successful, there was a lot of trouble and he was missing out on the joy of life. This is what he wrote. Uh, uh, pastor Cal at um, West Portsmouth sent this to me, so he's, he's gone from being pastor to my research assistant. <laughs> this is what Orson Bean wrote. Oh, it, it really came out of an interview. As he succeeded in show business from New York to Hollywood, Bean McCall having made a vow, I will be happy someday. He said he had plenty of highs due to great sex, drugs, rock and roll, fame, and even some politics. It all worked for a while to make him happy, Bean said, but then it just stopped working and became nothing. That's when he tried prayer with a nudge from a stranger. It was a 12-step program where he asked someone, what should I do? Bean said the man told him to thank God every morning and evening on his knees, and that could help him find happiness. 
Though he felt silly at first, Bean said he got down on his knees in the evening and said, if there's anybody up there, thank you for the day. Little by little, it stopped feeling foolish. I began to feel if my, as if my prayer was being heard, that whatever, whoever loved me, Bean said. Bean would go on to read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity before telling himself, I'll buy that Jesus is a son of God. And my life has gotten better and better, Bean said. That little prayer was what did it for me. Bean said that he had enough money and had always put fame in perspective. He said oh, he always wanted to be famous enough so that a head waiter would give him a good table. Walmart for me, but anyway. <laughs> but not so famous that he could not have a private life. But finding God was what ultimately gave his life meaning and him happiness. And he was a man who discovered that his status meant nothing. His life was nothing until he met Jesus. And what happens is that Jesus can set you free without qualifications. That's what indeed means. When he sets you free, you shall be free indeed. No qualifications. No compulsion, no sin will control your life and hold you down. Nothing will disturb your peace. You'll have the happiness that Jesus Christ has to give. You'll be totally free, free indeed. Now, you see, you can be adopted. Our Lord is teaching here, and it's taught throughout the New Testament, as a son or daughter of God. Now, the slave will never be part of the family. Now, slavery was a little bit different in Roman times than it was in American history, but it really makes no difference. A slave is a slave, and it's not good. It's a very bad thing. But in Roman times, a family, even a rich family, may only have several slaves, and they would treat it like the family. They had a room in the house. They sit at the table when it was time to eat dinner. But even though they were treated like the family, they weren't the family. And the measure that was that everybody in the family could walk out the front door, but they couldn't. And so as long as they were a slave, they were never free, no matter what blessing that they had. But a son or a daughter was a son or a daughter forever, and when the master died, the inheritance would belong to them. But for a slave, that would never be. What our Lord is saying here is that if you are compelled to sin, then really sin holds you in chains, and you are a slave to sin. But the Son can help you know the truth, and He will set you free. The word redemption, great word, wonderful New Testament word. And it means He bought out of slavery into freedom. His blood bought you out of slavery into freedom. Redemption. And if the Son sets you free... You're free without qualification. You are free indeed. No sin can control you. No compulsion can hold you down. Once you're free, you're free indeed. You will discover the life that God has to give you. Now, I have a, a, a theory that the reason people don't go to church or read Scripture or, or really want to become a Christian or even want to have Christian friends is that they don't want to see their sin. That, 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 that when they see their sin, they feel uncomfortable with what they've become and what they're like, and they don't want to see that. Now, back in October, I hurt my arm playing golf. I was playing, I was playing really well with my family. I was playing really well, and I'm just telling what happened. I'm not, this is not a, a modest brag. I'm just telling what happened. I birdied 15, which is a very, very hard hole. I came to 16, was a par 3, hit a really good 8-iron shot. I was close to the, to the hole, but as soon as my, my, the, the club hit the ball... I felt a pain in my arm, which was a horrific pain, almost as bad as having a heart attack, which I know what that feels like. And I couldn't play. I waited six weeks and played again, and the pain was no better. So finally, this is really hard for a man to do. As you know, I went to the doctor, went to an orthopedic uh, specialist, and uh, she said, sir, uh, you have golfer's elbow. Do you like medical terms? <laughs> They will go to medical golfer's elbow. And I don't think you need surgery. It's possible, but I want you to go to therapy first. So I've been going to therapy since the first part of January, twice a week. So I go to the, to the orthopedic doctor out in the, the Great Bridge area, and I go into a gigantic gymnasium. 
and I have a therapist and they put me through exercises, they do massages and they put uh, ultrasound on my arm and I've started hitting some golf shots actually in the room there to see if, if I'm progressing I'm, and I, I have no pain, which is wonderful. But anyway, it's a, it's a big gym and one of the walls of the gym is, is a total mirror. It's a complete mirror from the floor to the ceiling. And what it's there for is people can do their exercises in front of the mirror and they can see themselves. So I don't know if this ever happened to you, but the other day I, I walked by the mirror and I saw myself in full size, real life, walking. And it was, it was disgusting. <laughs> it was disturbing. My, my feet are splayed apart. And as a matter of fact, I do three, four hundred crunches a week. I have a pot belly. I'm stooped over. I have this gigantic bullet head with a little patch of hair in the middle. And I go, oh, well, it's just terrible. Oh. So I go home. My wife's sitting at the counter in the kitchen. And I came in and sat down beside her. I said, honey, I just had a terrible experience. She said, what? What happened? I, I'm leaving the orthopedic uh, doctors and, and therapy. And I walked by this, this full length, this big mirror on the wall. And I saw my, my feet splayed apart and my, my shuffling gait and hot belly. And I'm stooped over. And I got this big bullet head, little patch of hair in the middle. It was just, oh, it was terrible. And she leans over, puts her hand on my arm. And I thought she was going to say, honey, you're cute to me. Or she was going to say, Ernie, don't be so hard on yourself. But she put her hand on my arm. She leaned over. She said, don't walk by that mirror. <laughs> She's such an encouragement. <laughs> and I really think what's happening is that people don't want to see themselves in the mirror. It's just too uncomfortable. I don't want to hear about my sins. I don't want to hear about the things that's wrong in my life. I don't want to hear about how I displeased God. And maybe I'm being poked in the eye over and over and over again. But so what? I just can't deal with it. But here is the thing. That once you start living the life of Jesus, you'll be set free. And once the Son has made you part of the family, a son and daughter of God, a, a, a brother or sister of Jesus, you are free without qualifications. Don't you want that? 